ever heard the Bob Dylan song, The Times They Are a Changin'? Let me give you the first verse and tell you what, I'll do everyone a favor and just speak the lines rather than sing. Dylan is deep down a poet after all. Come gather round people wherever you roam and admit that the waters around you have grown and accept it that soon you'll be drenched to the bone if your time to you is worth saving. Then you better start swimming or you'll sink like a stone for the times they are a-changing. You might be wondering why I am quoting Bob Dylan lyrics. Honestly, because the times are a-changing. Sure, things change around us every single day, but right now especially, there are big changes taking hold that simply can't be ignored. Have you noticed how others around you are changing the way they work? The office has fewer people. You're doing more meetings using Skype or GoToMeeting. Friends have free time more during the week instead of just on the weekends. The progress toward this has been subtle, but there is a definite movement toward what we call the you economy. Entrepreneurship has been around for a long time, thousands of years, and the idea of supplementing full-time work with freelance projects or part-time work isn't new either. The idea behind the you economy isn't necessarily about owning a business or making more money. It hinges on the idea that you, yes, you, can control your destiny. And thanks to improvements in technology and the shifts in societal norms, that dream is becoming more and more of a reality each day. But don't take my word for it. Take the words of those we interviewed for this month's Success Talks. First up is Nelly Galan. Nellie is a first-generation immigrant and a self-made media mogul. If there's anyone who stands out in the you economy, it's her. After years of playing the business game with other people's chips, she realized she needed her own. Through hard work, plenty of failure, and a hefty dose of self-confidence and courage, she has become an inspiration to anyone who wants to take their dream by storm. Another entrepreneur doing his own thing is Gary Vaynerchuk. Gary builds businesses. He grew his family wine business from $3 million in revenue to a $60 million business in just five years. Now he runs VaynerMedia and helps other people build their businesses. Gary has his finger on the digital pulse of society and is translating that into a business and lifestyle that allows him to live on his terms. Our final success talk was conducted by Mel Robbins, success contributing editor, columnist, and best-selling author. Mel sat down with Adam Grant, author of the hit book Originals, and a professor of management and psychology at the Wharton School of Business at Penn. Mel and Adam have a truly lively conversation about what it takes to be an original and how that can apply to your life. We keep talking about how we here at Success are focused on you, our readers and listeners, and that is as true as ever this month. We know you have the power to change your own life. To become an integral part of the you economy, capture your dreams and take control to live the life you want to live. So listen carefully to this month's talks and get ready for success. I wish I could say I had more in common with my guest today, Nelly Golan. The first-generation immigrant and self-made media mogul is often dubbed the tropical tycoon for her focused drive to make things happen. I'd love to say I, too, have such a powerful nickname representing my heritage and work ethic, but sadly, I don't. Nelly is an Emmy Award-winning producer and at age 35 was the first Latina to become network president of Telemundo the American Spanish language television network. Her new book, Self Made, Becoming Empowered, Self-Reliant, and Rich in Every Way, is an inspiring call to action for anyone ready to take ownership of the circumstances in their lives. 
But what Nellie and I do have in common, besides our Latina heritage and shared sisterhood in the media industry, is this belief that we make our careers, our businesses, and our lives happen. Thank you for joining me today, Nellie. Shall be so happy to be here with you. So Nellie, your incredible drive is pretty evident from your successful career. I know a woman dubbed Tropical Tycoon by the New York Times Magazine has got to have something lighting her fire. I'm curious, what is your driving force? Well, I think it really comes from being an immigrant. You know, one of the things I say in the book is think like an immigrant. And it's because when your family has left another country, in in my case, it was Cuba, and my parents had to leave everything behind. And they had to start all over again. I thought from the time I was five years old that I was supposed to do something great with my life, that my parents had sacrificed so much for me to be here. And they had really suffered so much that I had to take advantage that only an immigrant understands the advantages of being in the United States. You know, we complain a lot about this country, but it is still the greatest country in the world for all of us to do well, especially women. So... Share a little bit more about your story. I gave an overview, but you have such an interesting background, both personally and professionally. I think our listeners would definitely benefit from hearing it straight from you. Well, I think my career has been very um, bizarre because I grew up in a Latino family where I was told every day uh, that I was going to get married and have a lot of kids. And, you know, like I think a lot of people, bad things that happened to me really changed the course of my life for the good. Uh, and it really started in all-girl Catholic school in high school where I was accused of plagiarism. I wrote a story and they thought it was an Ernest Hemingway story and I was suspended for three days. And when I went home and told my parents, they said, "I go ask the nuns for forgiveness. Like they took the side of the nuns even though I really hadn't done anything wrong. And in my anger... The only thing I could do was write a story for Seventeen Magazine, which was what I read back then, uh, about why you should never send your kids to all-girl Catholic school. And I sent it in, and then a couple of days later, the nuns were like, no, you, you know, we checked your story, and actually they gave me an A on the story. But three months later, I got a $100 check in the mail, and they said they were going to publish my article. And when they published my article, the head nun, the principal, called me in and she goes, we don't like your kind here. And she really yelled at me. And I interpreted it like she was expelling me. And so I went to the Board of Ed of the state of New Jersey. I called them and an African-American guy answered and I I go, can they do this? And he's like, yeah, because it's a private school, but you can go to the press. And so I went to my local newspaper And the next day came out in the paper, Cuban girl gets expelled for First Amendment issue. I always say that if if I had been born in this time, I'd be Malala by now because I would have Twittered (laughs) and I would have put it on social media and it would have become an even bigger deal. Uh, But the nuns called me back in and they apologized. And then Seventeen Magazine got so much press that they offered me the youngest guest editorship in the history of the magazine. And my entire life changed for the good. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, things like that happen sometimes that if you, you know, something makes you so mad that you act in a way that's not normal for you. And for me, risk taking was not normal. And because of that, my life took a turn and it it went down a trajectory I could have never imagined. That's amazing. So let's talk about this concept of moving forward or propelling ourselves forward in the way that you did in your own life. Uh, something we talk about in this month's issue is what we're calling the you economy. It's this notion that people and their entrepreneurial drive to build their own business or their own career are really emerging as kind of the future norm of things, and they'll ultimately be the most successful. So I'm so I see in the book where you talk about this concept of being self-made. So who is that self-made person? Like, can you paint a picture of what they believe or how they think? Well, I think having gone around the country the last four years and training so many women in entrepreneurship, the feedback I got was that a lot of people don't relate to the word entrepreneur. 
entrepreneur feels grandiose, but I think everybody can relate to the word, I want to become self-made, because that means that you're the master of your own destiny. And I think, and what I say in the book is that self-made is a mindset, and it's a mindset that you are you are going toward ownership, and you are an owner in some part of your life. So that means that even if you work for someone else, instead of thinking, oh, I hate this job, you're thinking, what can I learn from this job? What is this owner doing well and what are they doing not so well that when I own, I will do better? And that's a little switch in your mind that's like the movie Inception. It's a seed that grows. And then before you know it, you're thinking bigger. I think for me, it happened when I was 25 years old. I was running the rinky dinky little TV station and I was like the Burger King manager. You know, I worked 24 (laughs) hours a day. My boss never was at work. I was doing everything. I had no life. And one day I walked into work and I found out they had sold my little station. And I was devastated. I felt like, how could he sell the station and not tell me? Right. And I went to see him and I go, how could you do this to me? This is my baby. And he goes, young lady, those are my chips. You want to play? Go get your own chips. And I thought, what a jerk. But when I went back home and I thought about it for a couple days, I thought he's given me the greatest gift of my life. I need to think bigger. And from that moment on, everything about my life was thinking like an owner. And even though for four more years, I tried to start a business, I made no money. I was a stringer for CBS uh, doing reports, um, you know, in the middle of the night, whenever they needed. I knew that my destiny was to be an owner and to become self-made. And I think it is first about starting that mind set shift in your brain. Right, right. So they're in the driver's seat, you know, so to speak. So from your experience and in talking to people on this journey, what stands in the way of us being self-made? Like, how do you overcome that? The number one problem in becoming self-made is that we're all waiting for Prince Charming. And what I mean by that, and I don't mean just women, I think it's human nature to work hard and then hope and pray that someone else will see us and really know how great we are and somehow anoint us and find us. Uh, And I think that's a primal need. Whether you're a woman, whether you're a man, uh, you expect, you know, and it's not just a mate. I'm not talking about Prince Charming as mate, even though it can take that form. But, you know, we're expecting our mate or our boss or our government, or our company to save us. And people that are looking to their child or their parent to save them or are waiting for an inheritance or think that they're going to raise a kid and the kid's going to take care of them the rest of their life, all those things are barriers to you finally realizing you can do it. You are all you've got. And you live in the greatest time in history to accomplish anything you want. And all you have to do is do it. So we talked about some, you know, kind of unlikely examples of Prince Charming's. So how do we break away from that fantasy? Like, what are the steps to being our own Prince Charming? Well, I think for me, I can only speak for myself. I think for me, it came from really a lot of disappointment. And, um, you know, I feel like sometimes I, I pampered my bosses and did the work for them and did a lot of things, but with expectations that were unmet. Um, and I was with in relationships with people that I had unmet expectations and I realized that the common denominator in all my stories was me. And I think when I finally realized it is when I um, was in a very long-term relationship um, had my son, uh, and realized a year into the, into the, uh, my son being born that we had irreconcilable differences and we had to break up. And I had really put this man, uh, in such a pedestal of kind of more important than me. Like, you know, my career was less important. My everything was less important. And when we broke up, I went into a panic and I thought, what am I going to do? 
And one of my girlfriends came over and she says to me, let's do, let's write down the money you've made, the money you've saved, all the investments you've made. Because I started buying buildings and for cheap and, you know, and she's like, you're freaking Prince Charming. You're it. What are you talking about? And when she said that to me, I thought, she's right. I have been looking in all the wrong places for so long for what's already inside me. And I have to tell you that sometimes we can have an aha and a real change in a second. And after that, I thought, I'm going to make the most money of my life now. I'm going to do everything that in all these other people that I wanted, in my bosses, in my mates, I'm going to become all those things. And I, I have done the best in my life since that moment. And so for everybody, it's different. So I think that's, um, I think that's probably a, an exciting, I guess, key to this kind of self-made, uh, kind of you economy is that it's, it's a total mind shift. You know, it, it is a mind shift for people that have had grown up that have believed that you need to work as hard as you can for a company because you, you know, they're going to be loyal to you. So you need to be loyal to them. And we know now that that's not really always the case. So I, one way I think that I've read that you deal with the struggle is believing and using a personal mantra. So what's your personal mantra and what do you do to live this, this mantra? Well, I have, I've had different mantras at different times in my life. Like I almost start every year and I say, what's the theme for this year? What do I need to learn this year? And I remind myself of that mantra all the time. But I would say one of my better ones is get back on the horse. Because I think a lot of people that know me, they they always say to me, well, Nelly, I'm not you. You're fearless. And I say, are you kidding me? <laughs> I am the most afraid person in the world. And they say to me, yeah, but you've never failed. I go, are you kidding me? <laughs> My failure resume is three times longer than my success resume. And so I have had to make fear and failure my two best friends because they show up every day of my life, every day in big ways and in little ways. You know, I am afraid, you know, when I'm going to go speak in front of people every single time, I'm afraid that I'm going to run out of money. I'm afraid, I mean, some of them are ridiculous, you know. I'm afraid of, you know, athletic endeavors. I'm afraid of how I look. Um, and failure shows up every day. I get told no all the time. And I have failed in very big ways in my personal life, in business ventures. And sometimes those failures have brought me to my knees. And, you know, I've had to like cry in bed for three weeks. But the common denominator is that when fear and failure shows up, you have to do it anyway, because you're living through life. You've got to take risks. You're not going to become successful without taking risks. I've only hit it big in my life, maybe three times. So imagine how many times I failed to get three things that have worked. So I always tell myself, Nelly, get back on the horse, get back on the horse. Um, because there's nothing greater than perseverance. Nothing. And people win, not even if they're that talented, just if they get back on the horse. So I'm sure, Nellie, in, in the years that you've received a lot of pieces of advice, what's the best piece of advice you've ever received? My mother told me many years ago, you have to wait for big things. You have to be patient to wait for big things. And I'm like, I'm not waiting for anything. <laughs> and I have a hunter personality. But I do think as I get older, that patience is also a virtue. And that you have to do your best work and then detach from the results a little bit. Because sometimes when you think you win, you lose. It's not right for you. It's not meant for you. And sometimes when you think you lost... It's because around the corner is what you're supposed to do. All right. To round things out, Nelly, I want to unleash the uh, tropical tycoon side of you and ask you some fun questions. Okay. We like to do this with all of our guests. So um, first off, 
Aside from Tropical Tycoon, what other nicknames have you had? Well, I hate to say it, but my son calls me Army Man oh. because because <laughs> I'm so disciplined and I keep a tight ship at home. I think lately he's he's gotten off of that, but when he was little, he goes Army Man. <laughs> That's cute. When you speak, do you have a walkout song or a personal anthem? What is it? I would say I I love Gloria and Emilio Stefan because they remind me of my Cuban roots. Mm -hmm. So I always play the song Mi Tierra, which is all about your homeland when I walk out. And I always have to remember humbly that I'm an immigrant and that I'm Cuban and I'm Cuban American and I'm there to serve the women that I speak to. And then I just love the song by Kelly Clarkson, Break Away. Mm -hmm. Because I feel like that's what we all have to do is get out of our box and break away. Love it. Finally, Nellie, how do you define success? Well, for me, success is someone who's congruent in all parts of their life. Like if I was sitting here talking to you about becoming self-made or entrepreneurship and I didn't walk the walk of an entrepreneur, which means we don't live grandiose. It means you save your money. You're very cautious. You're, but then you enjoy certain things as well. Um, I think for me, it's being congruent in all parts of my life. It, my family life is very important to me. My husband, my son, my stepkids. Um, and so that, that kind of discipline, that kind of work ethic, that family time, but also leaving time for fun and for memories because, you know, it's all about how you live your life. But I think when you live a self-made life, um, what I want to share with all of you is that you really feel proud of yourself inside. It's not about other people telling you, you did good. Here's a trophy. Here's an award. You know, I don't even accept awards because my awards are inside of me because I know Every single thing that I did and all the sacrifices I made and all the ways I live every day of my life to be able to say I am self-made. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Nelly, for joining us. I know that um, we got some great insight about entrepreneurship and, and maybe the word entrepreneurship and that that's maybe not the best way to describe it. It's, it's just being self-made. It's just kind of taking taking the onus on yourself to really make something happen. And often the best way to do that is to just get started. Thank you so much, Shelby. I really appreciate it. What a spitfire Nelly is. But with that fire comes some fantastic ideas to help you reach your goals. First and foremost, we all need to take Nelly's advice and stop waiting for someone to save us. There is no Prince Charming coming to our rescue. That is the stuff of fairy tales. You are your own Prince or Princess Charming. If you're listening to this, you are off to a great start. You need to stop looking to outside factors and focus inward for how you can change things in your life. I want to encourage everyone to take up Nellie's practice of having an annual mantra. Her mantra for 2016 is, what do I need to learn this year? You can use that as your own mantra or come up with something that more precisely fits your goals. Changing your mantra annually will make sure that you are readjusting to how things are going in your life and meet the needs you have in the moment rather than the ones you have already met or that don't fit anymore. Stay tuned because the fun doesn't stop. Next up, I sat down with Gary Vaynerchuk for an entertaining conversation that will get you thinking. You are the future. Yes, you listening to this audio. Your independence, your need to grow and learn to succeed marks an ongoing change that is happening worldwide. More and more, people are taking control of their lives and not simply working for the man. I have, sitting next to me today, one among you who certainly knows what it is like to be the keeper of his own destiny. Gary Vaynerchuk builds businesses. Fresh out of college, he took his family wine business and grew it from a $3 million a year business to $60 million a year in just five years. Now he runs VaynerMedia, one of America's hottest digital agencies. 
as if that weren't enough, he is an angel investor, host of the Ask Gary V Show, and best-selling author of several books, including his latest, Hashtag Ask Gary V, one entrepreneur's take on leadership, social media, and self-awareness. Gary, welcome back to success. This is going to be fun. Thanks for having me. So let's just dive headlong into it, Gary. More and more people are describing themselves as (laughs) self-employed, be they entrepreneurs, small business owners, freelancers, however they describe it, they are thinking outside of what was once considered normal in terms of employment. We here are calling this the you economy, and it's gaining traction. Why do you think it's easier than ever before for people to step away from the corporate world and assert themselves as something more? The internet. The internet makes it practical. The end. You know, I don't think it's easier, by the way, because it's easier to try to do it because the internet gives people so much scale to reach more people. You can actually, if you're quite practical and you're scared, which is the fear is often why people didn't do entrepreneurship. If you're more practical, you can actually start a business that you work on from 7 p.m. to 2 in the morning because online, it's a 24-7 economy. You know, our parents and grandparents didn't have that luxury. You know, it wasn't easy to open up a business that actually functioned from 7 p.m. to 2 in the morning. Definitely not a reputable one. And so I think very simply, the reason this is happening is because the Internet now at 20 years, the consumer Internet is at scale and people can jump in. But I will say, and I'm not here to be Debbie Downer, it's easier to do it. It's not necessarily easier to be successful. It takes skill to be a winning entrepreneur. We will get to all of that for sure. But uh you know, while we're talking about this you economy idea, how would you characterize the positives of it? How is the increasing number of people being self-employed a good thing for our society and world at large? Truth is, that's such a macro statement. I'm not sure what it means in terms of good. I can tell you on an individual basis, anybody who's listening to this, it's a hell of a lot more exciting to live your life on your terms versus having to be somewhere because somebody told you so. You know, so having leverage to being able to do what you want. Being an entrepreneur is not great because you're going to make trillions of dollars. Being an entrepreneur is great because you can do what you want to do. And so the freedom of if, you know, if you want to take a four day weekend with your family to Disney and not having to think about what else that means, um, other than thinking about your own business, uh, is quite empowering. And so to me, the thing that has made me the happiest of being an entrepreneur is I'm doing what I want to do when I want to do it. Sure, I'm working way harder than people that work a nine to five, nine to seven, but I'm doing that happily. And so it's the options that this creates for so many that is so incredible. You know, there's always naysayers, uh, haters, we call them today. What, what is the best way to deal with negative people out there who just can't fathom why you would want to put so much of yourself into your own business? You know, truth is I've never really, I I couldn't even imagine allowing an outside force to dictate your happiness or what you're going to do. And I include my parents and wife and children into that. So the thought of, the thought of Rick from Kansas and his tweet being a force in my decision on how I'm going to live my life. I don't think a true bred entrepreneur has ever even given any thought to the outside forces. And if they have, that's okay, because all the way from 100% true bread to 50-50, there's a lot of success in that. Um, I would tell people, look, you're wired in a way, listen, I listen to what people say about me or say about it. I respect other people's point of views, I really do. But in a world where I recognize I only get to live one time, it's really hard for me to get really going on, uh, on somebody's point of view that, you know, oh, you shouldn't do this. You're going to fail. First of all, I thrive on proving people wrong. I prefer more people told, you know, I'm actually upset that things are going well for me for so long that people are starting to doubt me less. I'm trying to think about what I need to do to get that action back. Um, so I love the haters, the trolls, the negativity, because it drives me. I want to stick it to them. So in this issue of success, we're talking a lot about the positives of this new movement of entrepreneurship, the U economy. Let's flip it on its head for a little bit. What are some of the negatives? The negatives are everybody who's listening to this thinks they can do it. Like there's no conversation around building a business being a talent. It's almost like a birthright in America, especially. That's crazy. Like I want to be a point guard in the NBA, 
Like, it's not going to happen. I don't have the physical tools. And I think a lot of people that are listening need to think about, are they better off being a great number two or a great number four, where they'll be far more successful and far more financially fruitful than to just be an entrepreneur? I do think there is a little bit of a, a little bit of a lack of uh, understanding that it is a skill. Yes. So here's how I think about it. Years ago, not everybody could go to Yankee Stadium, get an at-bat against a major league pitcher, and then have that result dictate their future. That's what's great now. Everybody can try. But the truth is, the far majority of people going to Yankee Stadium would strike out badly. Now, if you randomly had talent and could crush three home runs in a row and get signed by the Yanks, and years ago that would have never happened because you were in the middle of nowhere and never had that chance, that's what entrepreneurship and the internet is doing. It's giving all of you that are listening right now that have the skills the opportunity to prove it. Problem is, a lot of people don't. So how can we know if we're on the right track, striking out on our own, if or if we are one of those people who you were talking about That's above who maybe would be better number yeah. twos or number fours? I think results. Like if you're listening right now and you've been trying to make it on your own for five years and you're still struggling and living at home, you've got a problem. Like you've had five years to prove it. Maybe it's time. Now also you might be six months away from turning the corner. Truth is I'm very scared to answer this question in this format because it's a very individual basis. There's plenty of people that at year three, after being in a studio apartment, maybe having a ton of credit card debts, turned the corner and went on to have huge success. There's also a stunning amount of people that will continue to lose for the rest of their lives because they don't have the self-awareness to become a number two or number three. So look, I think this comes down to self-awareness. It's why I'm pushing self-awareness more. Um, I do think regret is the scariest thing of all. So if you have any inclining to take a jump, do it. Because at 80, you'll be more upset that you didn't try than the fact that you lost your life savings. I really believe that, by the way. And so I think, um, I think that's something to keep in mind. So since we are on the topic now of self-awareness, this is such a uh, big, big deal for you uh, lately. Obviously, it's important, self-awareness is, in deciding what we want to do in life. Uh, so how can we make it a daily practice? Tell us how to, the how-to of uh, being more self-aware day in and day out. I've struggled with this. There's something I'm starting to figure out. I think you create an inner circle of trust with the people that know you the best, where you allow them and make them feel safe to call you out on your shortcomings. And equally, accentuate your strengths. If you can create an ecosystem of your parents, your spouses, your siblings, your closest work husband and wives, as they call each other, people that work together quite a bit, I would tell you if you really want to know who you are, to call a dinner, a summit, speak for the first hour and a half, make everybody feel really safe to make fun of you and call you out on your shortcomings, recognize it may not happen that night, but go on a 100-day journey to make the people that know you the best feel safe to tell you the things they don't want to tell you because they love you. And then when you hear it, own it, understand that that's how you're being perceived, and then decide if you're okay with that or if you want to change it. Otherwise, you're born with it. I'm born with it. I'm... I've, I, I'm only living on emotional intelligence. I'm dramatically IQ uh, weaker than the far majority of people listening to this. Um, so I was born with it. Many of you are born with it. But if you feel like you're not, that has been the only way that I've figured out to scale it a little bit. So I want to go backwards for okay. people who aren't as familiar with your story. Okay. Did you go through a similar process like that when you took over your parents' wine business? No, I'm a little bit different. I was a DNA. I'm an immigrant. I was born in Russia. The way to make it in America was education, and I was failing out of every class as a 12-year-old because I was making thousands of dollars a weekend selling baseball cards, and I knew that I was going to be a great businessman as a kid. So I was very self-aware. I took the risk on me in the 90s in, when, when entrepreneurship was not a word, and even though I was making $2,000 a weekend because I didn't have grammar skills and getting an F on an English paper, my teachers and my friend's parents thought that I was a loser. They just did, they played in a world that I didn't believe in. So I was deploying my self awareness to keep up my self esteem because the machine and the market was telling me I was a loser. And the only people that were telling me that I was a winner was myself and my mom. And that was enough to build the foundation of what is going to build a humongous financial empire. And I'm very proud of that. And that's what I want for others because I feel grateful that I had that. And so I didn't. By the time I ran my, I mean, let's talk about Wine Library. As a 21 year old, the first 
first year, 22 year old, the first year that I ran the business, we grew from three to $10 million in revenue. You have to understand that's insane when you have a small family business. Like it changed our lives. That meant everything I did from 12 and more meaningfully 14 to 22, I put in the work. Every weekend in college, I took Amtrak from Boston to New Jersey on a Friday afternoon so that I could work in the liquor store on Saturday and Sunday morning and then go back to school instead of hooking up with chicks. Like I put in the work. I put in the work. Like, so I'm not, I don't use myself as a proxy to other people because I'm an anomaly. I don't even give my own advice to people. I actually wish I could go back and hook up with a couple more chicks. Like, I didn't need to work every minute. Well, first you get the money, then you get the chick. I get it, but like in hindsight, balance is everything. And like, I definitely could have went to another spring break. I definitely could have taken one more week vacation in my 20s. I mean, I literally completely sacrificed all leisure and happiness outside of business happiness from basically 22 to 30, and I mean every minute. And so that's an extreme version, and I don't think that that's scalable for everybody, but I understand why it happened. Like, I understand why I'm successful. I put in the work. My friends, most of you are lazy. Like, let's just call it what it is. Like, you want the audacity of having million-dollar businesses, but you don't want to put in the 15 hours of work that almost all of these businesses need. You're not a genius that's going to invent something that's going to change the world, that's going to make you a billionaire that way. And oh, by the way, Travis from Uber and Mark Zuckerberg from Facebook and Ev Williams from Twitter, they all work 20 hours a day. So this ability to tell it like it is uh, is part of what makes you what I think a lot of people would fairly call an outgoing personality, uh, <laughs> to put it nicely. Uh, do you think that that uh, being self-employed, uh, being a part of the you economy requires that type of personality in order to succeed? As a matter of fact, I think it's never been better to be an introvert because mathematics and scalability on the internet, which are often traits similar to people that are a little bit more introverted, has never been easier to build a business. So I would actually say in a world where people are focusing on these personalities and look how successful they become, oh, I need to be that, there are far more people that you've never heard of. There are far more people making lots of money you've never heard of than the people that are gracing the covers of Success Magazine or Inc. or Fast Company. So no, I do not believe. I believe that if you're an introvert and you're math skilled, you need to go all in on that and not take media training. The biggest surprise you've experienced so far as a successful and respected entrepreneur, what is it? That's a very good question that I don't recall being asked. The biggest surprise, mm, I guess, and I just, probably that's why I didn't want to answer it this way, but I guess it's the truth and I want to stick with the truth. I've been surprised by how many people have bought into, well, I'm going to work smart, not hard. <laughs> the people that are winning are doing both. Go take a really cold shower. I promise you, you're not outsmarting me. The problem is you're just not outworking me. So I think the biggest surprise is how many people think there's some random system, how there's some crazy algorithm or process that's going to create passive income. How there's this, like, that they're so smart, and that's why they'll be able to have more time to surf and be on boats and enjoy their wealth. I, I've been surprised by people's naivete that um, hard work isn't part of the equation. Do you not have some secrets for productivity or efficiency when you are working, though? I do, but I think we all have different ones. I think some people use technology, ift. If this, then that is a great product that tech friends use, but I use people. My productivity comes out of having DRock film all my moves and create content that way, by having two assistants. I actually scale and am more productive by having other human beings help me do the things I don't want to do. So looking forward to the future, what do you see as the next big thing? Can you give us some insight? You know, it's funny, a lot of people position me, if you Google me now, if you're listening to this, you know, futurist and predictor and, and thought leader, you know, I just think I'm practical. I think the next big thing are the things that are actually happening. I think Snapchat is happening. I think live stream video is happening. I think Facebook is happening. Um, I think mobile device first economy is happening. So I think virtual reality is looming in a decade. I do think most of the people listening to this will sit in their room wearing contact lenses and think they're living their lives, which I know freaks the crap out of everybody. But I think that technology is clearly here. I think it's 15 to 20 years away the way the internet was in 1990. Um, so I would say that's looming and that will change the world the way the internet did. But uh, 
in the short term, it's the fact that most people here don't realize that the telephone has become the television and the television is the radio and everything that's happening in your phone is what's really happening. There's going to come a day where people sit with their virtual reality goggles, mouth sort of agape, and they can look at you and I talking right now. That's right. So just a few more questions for you. These are more fun. Okay. Uh, and we ask these kinds the of first, questions. The first batch was super fun. To We ask these to everyone who appears on the Success CD. Are you ready? Super ready. You're a big family guy. Can you share your favorite thing to do as a family? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. I think, you know, I live very close to Central Park, and it's such a luxury. It's such a special place in New York City. And the fact that literally on a one-second whim, I can be with my kids inside of Central Park within a three-minute walk is incredible. And we do that quite a bit on weekends. And so that's my favorite. The most important one here, uh, you'll say, I, I hope. How are your New York Jets going to do this year, and what would you change if you were the head coach or the general manager? Yes, I want to be the head coach and general manager. Um, you know, right now in the recording of this, we have still not signed Ryan Fitzpatrick, our quarterback, who had a very good year last year, who was a quarterback that I've always said was way better than people thought, and then eventually ended up on our team, so I loved him very much. And I said I loved him very much because if he goes somewhere else, I'll hate him very much. But right now, I'm very hopeful that they sign him. The Jets have a very difficult schedule on paper, and the NFL draft hasn't happened yet as of this recording. So I will answer this firmly in August and properly, like I have consistently. But as of right now, I'm just like any other fan, a fanatic, which means I'm hopeful that it's going to be okay. If I would change anything... I would I would draft a quarterback in the first two rounds of every NFL draft because the quarterback has become the singular the way the rules have been uh, manipulated over the last 15 years. The quarterback is the driving force to winning a Super Bowl, and I feel like you have to continue to draft in the first two rounds one until you get the one. Yeah, and if they don't re-sign Fitzpatrick and they don't draft one this year, then at least they have Geno Smith to fall back on. You're razzing me now, Gary. Lastly, how do you define success? Being able to wake up every morning and do two things. One, smile and to the point where it almost breaks your face. And two, know that you're in full control. Look, I'm scheduled to take the stage right now. But the truth is, I could have texted this morning and said, I'm not coming. And it would have repercussions. I probably wouldn't have a relationship with this organization, things of that nature. But it's kind of cool. Truth is, I could. And that's so empowering. I just know I can do anything I want at any moment. Listen, nobody's more scheduled than me. My cal- my Google Calendar is my boss, but the truth is anytime I want to push something, I can. Living a life where it, you get to decide and then you're the big girl and boy to decide if you're dealing, willing to deal with those repercussions is invigorating. It's incredible. I can do whatever I want. That's a big deal. And by the way, it's not about making a million dollars a year. People can do that making $80,000 a year. It's about that empowerment. That's what the U economy that we've been talking about is all about. No question. Just make sure that you're good enough to succeed. Because again, the 18th employee at Facebook made more money than everybody listening to this combined. And that person was self-aware that they weren't going to build the next Facebook. Got it? Awesome insight, Gary. Thanks so much for your time. Thanks for having me. I don't think we have enough time to go through all the great things Gary had to say. Let's highlight just a few, then you can go back and listen again to get the rest. Something that seems to be a theme for entrepreneurs and anyone who has taken control of his or her own life is this idea of not allowing those outside forces to dictate your happiness. Does it sound familiar? Not waiting on Prince Charming anymore? I've heard that somewhere else. Anyway, Gary thrives on proving people wrong. Now, you don't have to work from that philosophy, but you should sit down and take a look at your goals and plans. Are they shaped by outside forces? What are those forces? Sometimes, outside forces, like your family, need to factor in. But ultimately, it needs to all come back to you and what you want. What makes you happy, fulfilled, and feeling successful. To know what makes you fulfilled, you need to understand yourself fully. A great way to do that is by calling a summit of your inner circle of trust. Call on the people who know you best to sit down with you and evaluate you on just a few facets of life and success that you've previously determined. This might seem counterintuitive to my first point of not letting outside forces dictate your happiness, but hear me out. Asking for feedback from those you trust the most 
isn't going to determine your life dreams. It's meant to help you understand yourself, get a 360 view, if you will, so you can account for any shortcomings or focus on areas of strength. Now, once you have this information, you have to put it to work. Part-time work on your dreams isn't going to cut it. Now, that doesn't mean you need to quit your full-time job to focus on your dream. What I mean is that you have to put full-time effort and thought into it. Gary spent every weekend in college working on the wine business. It wasn't an instant success. He put in the man hours while going to school. If you want to succeed, it's going to take work. There aren't any shortcuts. You have to take what you learn here from success, from your family and your summit, from other resources, and enact everything in your life, and then keep at it. Two people who have definitely put in the work are Mel Robbins and Adam Grant. I'm excited to share their conversation with you because it is chock full of ideas that will fuel your next move in the U economy. Hey, success listeners, Mel Robbins here. I've just joined the success team as a contributing editor, and I could not be more fired up to get to know each and every one of you. You may know me from television because I'm an analyst for CNN, but what you don't know is that I travel the world giving speeches on the science of confidence and courage, and I could not be more confident about the fact that this conversation that you're about to listen to is going to change your life. Has anyone ever told you the mathematical odds of you even being born? Believe it or not, it's one in 400 trillion. That makes you an original. Now, one of my favorite thinkers on the planet just wrote a book about what it means to be an original and how you can leverage your own unique strengths to change your work, your relationships, and the world. I could not be more thrilled to introduce you to a man I have admired for a long time. His name is Adam Grant. He is the best-selling author of Give and Take. He is also Wharton's top-rated teacher for over four years straight. He has written a best-selling book, Originals, How Nonconformists Move the World. And I could not be more excited to introduce you to the man, the professor, the legend, Adam Grant. Welcome, Adam. Thank you, Mel. You've given me a lot to live up to, and I will surely let you down, but I'm thrilled to be here. You better not let me down. because Well, you're an original, so I know that there's no way you're going to let me down. So let's start with an obvious question so that all our success listeners have the right context for the discussion today. What's the difference between being unique and being an original? When I think about original people, I think about starting with creativity. So you're somebody who has Ideas that are new, different, but also practical and useful. But creativity is the beginning. It's not the end. Because a lot of people have great ideas and don't do anything with them. When you become original, it's when you take the initiative to make your ideas a reality. And so I think about people who are originals as really people who champion new ideas, as opposed to just dreaming them up. Gotcha. So everybody's got unique ideas. What you're saying is you become an original when you start championing the ideas. You bring them out of your head and into the world. Is that right? Bingo. Awesome. Okay. So, you know, I read in the book, you talked about how you used to feel like you were a conformist and that seems to be the opposite of being an original. So can you explain why you were a conformist and what changed you? Yeah. You know, I remember growing up, I followed not only every rule that I could find, but even things that weren't rules, but I was afraid they might be. Um, I was, you know, very, very typical firstborn, wanted to, you know, respect my elders, follow authority, um, get along with a parent, I guess, you know, gain approval of my parents as much as possible. I remember um, in elementary school, I got called to the principal's office once, and I found out I was not in trouble, and I still cried. Because, <laughs> I mean, the, just the thought of being sent to the principal's office was mortifying. And... I think what happened over time was I started questioning more and more whether the rules I was following actually made sense. Who created them? Where did they come from? And I noticed that the people I looked up to the most were the nonconformists and that that was what what you really had to be to be original was to say, look, like I'm not going to do something just to fit in or just because I'm afraid of standing out. I am going to champion an idea because I believe in it. And the more that I I saw that my role models were nonconformists, the more convinced I became that I should be a little bit more like them. 
I want to unpack this a little bit um, because, you know, we're talking about this concept of being an original. And, you know, before you and I started talking, I was thinking that being an original is either about the actions you take or it's about the mindset that you have. And now I'm wondering if being an original is both about action and mindset. Can you expand on that? Yeah, I think it is both. You know, I think that it's always hard to draw the line and say like, aha, someone has become original. <laughs> we're, we're done. But I think that people who repeatedly take original action, um, they tend to share some common mindsets. And you know, one of my favorite examples of this, which you are well familiar with, is there's this evidence that we can predict your job performance and your commitment at work just by knowing what internet browser you use. <laughs> yeah. Tell everybody uh, about that. It's a great story. Yeah. Not everyone likes this result, but there is good evidence uh, from some very careful, rigorous studies suggesting that people who use Chrome and Firefox are better at job performance, and they also stay 15% longer in those jobs than the Internet Explorer and Safari users. So, Why? If you don't know what browser you use, you should probably ask Jeeves, by the way. But, <laughs> yeah, I, I wondered, <laughs> same question, why? It's not about computer knowledge or, or technical proficiency. It's about how you got the browser, because... If you use Internet Explorer or Safari, those were pre-installed on your computer, and you just accepted the default option that was handed to you. Whereas if you wanted Chrome or Firefox, you had to ask, is there another browser out there? Right? You had to question the default and then take a little bit of initiative, be a bit resourceful, and, and download a different browser. And that turns out to be a pretty good window into how people approach their jobs. So you know, I think that what we see with a lot of originals is they are – people who constantly are rejecting the default and looking for a better option. It's like, um, you know, let's say you're standing in line waiting for a taxi. You've done that many times before, but suddenly you start to wonder, like, hey, there are all these cars passing by. They have empty seats. Why can't I get a ride in one of those? And then Uber is born. Or you do what a lot of us do, where you look around and you say, well, if I just crossed the street and went to the other corner, I could cut the line. <laughs> that, that's a less entrepreneurial version of being an original or at least having an original thought rather than standing in a line, I suppose. Maybe a less polite version of being an original, too. <laughs> yes, fair enough. Fair enough. Um, Adam, do originals have common characteristics? They do. So I thought going in that originals would be people who love taking risks, who had great ideas, and who are first movers. They acted ahead of everyone else. And I was stunned to discover that originals, on average, are more cautious than their peers, that they have more bad ideas than their peers, and that they are epic procrastinators. Okay, I got to stop you there because that makes absolutely no sense. Because we've started the conversation by talking about how originals become champions for their ideas, which sounds like you're somebody that would embrace the risk associated with championing ideas because, you know, we all think we're going to get rejected. You started by saying the first characteristic was that they're not necessarily people that embrace risk. Can you explain that further? Uh, my, my favorite illustration of this is a nationally representative study of entrepreneurs in the U.S. And if you look at the ones who are big risk takers, when they have a big idea, they quit their day jobs and they go all in to start a company. Whereas the more cautious ones say, you know, I don't know if all the, this is going to work out. I don't want to put all my eggs in one basket. So I'm going to keep my day job and start my company on the side as a hobby. And that second group is 33% less likely to fail than the first group. And what you see is that that, that caution leads them to actually test and refine their products, figure out if their services make sense. They're much more comfortable pivoting because they haven't just given up an entire job in order to start this one company. And so you get a lot more flexibility when you're cautious. You also don't take unnecessary or stupid risks. And I think it's why we see there's so many great original entrepreneurs who kept their day jobs. Marcus Person, who started Minecraft, kept his day job for almost a year. Uh, Jessica Heron, who started Stella and Dot, uh, started that on the side. Um, example after example is not a coincidence. And I think that that kind of caution, when you do finally go and take the risk, it's a much smarter risk than it would have been before. That's fascinating. And I think it's also very encouraging for a large number of people that are listening right now to this conversation because so many folks are working on, so on building something as they're keeping 
their day job. And so to hear that, you know, you've got 33% more likelihood of, of uh, being successful is really encouraging. The other of the three that really piqued my interest was procrastination. So you, you found a common characteristic related to procrastination with originals? I was, uh, I was very dismayed to find this because I'm the opposite of a, of a procrastinator. I'm a procrastinator. What, the, what does that mean? So you know the, the, the panic that you feel a few hours before a big deadline when you haven't made enough progress? Yes. Well, I feel that like six months before the deadline. Oh, is that your <laughs> form of exercise? Apparently, right? I just, like the, the moment something is assigned or I have an idea, I feel this tremendous pressure to get it done and make sure that I'm not behind. And I always thought that it was, that was a good thing. But then I had this student named Jihei who told me she had her most creative ideas when she was procrastinating. And I was like, that's cute. Where are the four papers you owe me? <laughs> but no, actually, she was one of our most creative students. And I challenged her to get some data. She ended up studying a bunch of different companies. We also did some randomized controlled experiments. And we found that people who sometimes procrastinated were more creative than those who procrastinated like me and dove right in. And you know, there, there are also great examples of this. Da Vinci was a big procrastinator. He, um, he worked on and off on the Mona Lisa for 16 years. And he kept being distracted by other things. Like, oh, I wonder if I could design a flying machine. Guess we won't be doing any painting this year. But some of those diversions actually led him to new discoveries. Like he got curious about optics. And what he learned about that changed the way he modeled light and made him a fundamentally better painter. And that's one of the real benefits of procrastination is that it helps with divergent thinking. You don't just get stuck with your first few ideas. You actually get to work with a much wider range of ideas. It also gives you time to incubate so that, you know, ideas can simmer, they develop, which is why Frank Lloyd Wright did his biggest masterpiece, Falling Water, after almost nine months of procrastinating on it. And, you know, I think we should, uh, we should sometimes say, look, we don't have to rush to get an idea developed. There's something to be said for waiting for the right time. Huh. You know, that's really interesting because you can also find a million examples in projects that lots of people take on, whether it's writing a book and realizing you, you basically write seven books before you hit the one that you're supposed to write. And, and business plans, I'm sure as a professor at Wharton, you see iteration after iteration after iteration of an original idea that moves considerably as people, whether you call it procrastinating or let the idea incubate. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's, you know, and that, that actually goes to the, you know, the, the third point about how originals have more bad ideas than the rest of us. The, the way that they end up coming up with these masterpieces or amazing creative discoveries or big new business ideas is they just generate more volume than their peers. And that gives them a better shot at stumbling on something that's truly original. And what better way to procrastinate on your current idea than generate 20 more? Gotcha. So it's not necessarily like shelve it, but if you're generating idea after idea after idea that gets rejected, you're still in the process of creating an original idea and that what you found is that originals threw things against the wall and were willing to kind of push them out of their heads, and that that, that volume is what ultimately made them successful. It is. And the, the funny thing is that most originals are not any better judges of good ideas than their peers. They don't have better taste, and they don't even have higher hit rates. They just generate more sheer volume, and that means they've, they've created more variety, and most people underestimate how much you need. So if you look at brainstorming, for example, in a typical brainstorming meeting, you'll get 10 to 20 ideas. And if you really track the novelty and quality of those ideas, it's only after you have 200 on the table that you've maxed out on coming up with something that's new and different. Wow. So if there's one keystone habit, you know, kind of like that, that, that corner habit that really creates a ripple effect for somebody, what's one habit that folks listening could adopt that could help them become an original? Well, one of the easiest ways to be original, actually, is to get better at recognizing other people's good ideas and then help them champion them. Because the, the sad thing is, whenever you create a new idea, you are blind to whether it's a good one or not. And most of us are blind on the positive side. We fall in love with our ideas, and we can't tell whether they're good or not. And if you can get good at idea selection then you can add a ton of value by helping people avoid false positives and false negatives so that they don't bet on bad ideas and reject good ones. Um, you know, if people are bettered at that, right, it wouldn't have, 
wouldn't have taken, you know, a, a last ditch effort to save Seinfeld and NBC or, you know, the 13th publisher to finally say, yeah, you know, Harry Potter is longer than a typical children's book, but this is a really fascinating story. So how do you get better at, at idea selection? Yeah. How do you, how do you get, so if you're somebody that you're either managing people or maybe you run a small business and, or, or even you're just a parent and, and you, you hear something that sparks something in you and, and you think it's a cool idea. How do you, how do you support somebody in bringing that to fruition? Well, I think the first thing that you do is you generate your own ideas before you evaluate other people's ideas. There are these uh, really cool experiments by Justin Berg at Stanford who finds that managers especially are too risk averse that, you know, if they bet on a bad idea, they are going to embarrass themselves. Whereas if they reject a good idea, most of the time, no one will ever know. And so they, they avoid a lot of unusual possibilities. Justin was open, able to open their minds just by having them spend five minutes generating ideas before they vetted other people's ideas. And what that did was it opened them up into a creative mindset instead of you know, being stuck in a, like a judging or evaluative mindset. And so I think we should all have a rule, right? We generate ideas of our, of our own, even in a different domain, before we, we consider whether other people's ideas are good. And then, you know, I think the, the next step, if you want to really help people champion their ideas, is you look to people that I've come to call disagreeable givers, who um, a Google programmer said, that's like somebody with a, a bad user interface, but a great operating system. Um, people who are gruff and tough on the surface, but underneath have others' best interests at heart. They're great advocates for ideas because they will tear them apart um, but unlike highly agreeable people who like to get along and have harmony, they will not mind rocking the boat and they will run through walls for you if you can get them excited about your idea. So it sounds like one key tactical takeaway that somebody could apply immediately is if you're going to meet with your team and let's say you're brainstorming ideas about how to either increase sales this quarter or, or how to close a piece of business that's been a really long consultative selling process. Before you ask everybody to start uh, sharing their ideas, you as the person leading the meeting spend five minutes on your own trying to generate your own. And that actually puts you in a mindset where you're, you're open to hearing the other ideas. Is that, is that one thing that you could do? You got it. Okay, awesome. So here's a here's a question for you. So, you know, I think a lot of this is is pretty straightforward if you are your own boss or if you're thinking about this with regard to your own creative project or you're thinking about it as it relates to your kids. But what if you're somebody that's listening to us talk and, you know, you're you're going to buy a copy of the originals and read it? What are you going to learn about how if you're an original inside a company, you know, where you know, you have a cool original thing you want to champion. What's the best way to get other people to buy into your ideas, Adam? Oh, well, I, yeah, it's funny. When I sat down to write originals, I was thinking about it in some ways as the sequel to creativity, that we have a lot of good guidance about how to generate ideas, but much less about how to get them heard. And mm. a, a lot of the book is about that. One of my favorite insights uh, came from uh, a, a study combined with a, a story at Disney so the most successful movie of 1994 was The Lion King. And it almost never got made because it was shot down over and over again when it was pitched as, I quote, Bambi in Africa with lions. No. <laughs> yes. I have no idea what that movie is going to be about. And I am terrified for Bambi. Yes. So the, the moment that the, the Lion King got the green light was when a producer in the room reframed it and said, this is Hamlet with lions. And all of a sudden it clicked. Everyone got it. People are like, oh, the, the, you know, the uncle's going to kill the father and the son's going to have to avenge it. And now they, could, they can envision the, the characters in the plot. And this is something that, that most people struggle to do when they, when they communicate original ideas, is they have something really unfamiliar. And mm. one of the ways that you can make it familiar is by connecting it to something that people already understand which is why a lot of startups are pitching themselves now as Uber for X. Because, you know, you, you might have a really unusual way of, of thinking about a product or a service, but if you can connect it to Uber, which a lot of people get, then they're like, oh, okay, I can, I can kind of see that. You know, just to, to round out our discussion, what's been the single most impactful 
piece of advice that you've received in your professional career? The one that, that sticks with me the most here is I, I had a mentor, Ellen Langer, who said, look, you know, one, one of the things that we struggle a lot with is hard decisions where we look to what other people you know, are doing and then we end up conforming. And if you want to make an original decision, she said, you know what? Don't make the right decision. Just make the decision right. And what does that mean? Well, what it means is she's like, look, any hard decision that you're facing, chances are you can make a perfectly good case for both of the options. And you can't really forecast how they're going to play out. So the best thing you can do is focus most of your mental energy on once you've made the decision, making the most of it. And that means worrying less about the choice and taking a step back so that once the decision is something you're stuck with, you are ready to turn it into a decision that you can take ownership over, which means implementing it in ways that are different from what other people would have done. I think that that's, that's one of the things I noticed over and over again with, with people who made choices that, you know, that were non-conforming or original in some ways is they said, yeah, there are a lot of other cool things that I could have been doing, and I don't know how those would have played out. But I am so glad that I didn't just follow the crowd and do what everyone else is doing. And that gives me tremendous joy to say, at least, you know, I kind of marched to the tune of my own drummer. And that is, at the end of the day, what being an original is all about. Not only marching to the tune of your own drummer, but listening to it and championing those ideas. So last but not least, everyone who appears on the Success CD gets hit with a few kind of fun questions. So you ready? I'm ready. All right, cool. If you had a superpower. What would it be, Adam? Immortality. Really? You want to stay around that long? Absolutely. Wow. I think I'd get sad because I would like, you know, I'd miss Chris when he's gone, my husband and our kids. <laughs> but that's kind of cool. <laughs> no, everyone else has to have it too. Oh, okay. Well, if there's conditions, then maybe I would take it as well. Favorite movie and why? If I had to choose one favorite movie, I would say, you know, especially in, in this domain, um, I, I really loved and got a lot out of Batman Begins, um, which I thought just had a, a really fantastic origin story, sort of reframing everything I thought I knew about how to create a superhero. And uh, I thought it was a, a great analysis of how, um, you know, oftentimes becoming a symbol uh, is, is much more powerful than, than just it being a person. Um, and that, that also, that sometimes out of the worst experiences come the greatest contributions. You know, leave it to a guy with a PhD in org psych to turn a Batman movie into something <laughs> profound. Most fascinating person you've ever met, excluding me, of course. Ah, well, <laughs> then I'm going to have to take a step back. Uh, most fascinating <laughs> person I've ever met. Uh, there's so many. I think... Uh, I think that, I mean, one of the most interesting is uh, is J.J. Abrams, uh, the, mm. the creator of Lost and the, the director of the new Star Wars movie. Uh, he just, he reads more widely than pretty much anyone I've ever met. And it's just like this fountain of knowledge. And how do you define success, Adam? I define success as, um, as making other people more successful. Oh, that's awesome. So awesome. And I could not be more thrilled that I have had the opportunity to spend the time with you today talking to you about your incredible work, Adam. So thank you. Oh, um, no, that's, thank you. That's a real honor. So what's the verdict? Are you an original? Whether you are or aren't an original, Mel and Adam had some great insights that can help you. The biggest surprise for me was what Adam shared about originals being procrastinators and that in the right situation, this can be a good thing. Adam told us that procrastination helps divergent thinking and allows time for ideas to incubate. Sometimes waiting for the right idea at the right time is better than being on time with the wrong idea or the wrong time for that idea. Self-doubt is a common problem entrepreneurs face. It can stop you from living the life you want to lead. So transform your self-doubt into idea doubt. Adam and Mel tweak this concept of self-doubt so that instead of asking the question of why you can't do something, you instead retool your thinking to ask why an idea isn't the right one. According to Adam, idea doubt is energized. 
It will fuel your mind, spark new thoughts, and can take you to new levels. How can you take the failure or moment in time that is causing you to doubt yourself and turn it into a learning opportunity, a way to improve? Speaking of improving, I know there was a lot in this month's talk. Too much for one sitting, maybe. So I encourage you to listen to all the success talks again. Go into your second listen with questions you need or want answered. Focus on specific ideas or items that can help you to take control of your life as you embark on this journey in the you economy. As for me, I'm going to try to remember that I am the common denominator. I'm going to use that idea to really take a hard look at each situation and what I can do to change it and not wait for someone else to come along and do it for me. And I will definitely be putting together a summit of people I trust to help me learn more about who I am as a person and as a leader. I know I have room for improvement, so why not start now? Don't wait until you need to change. Get a head start so that when situations arise, you have a plan, a way to handle them based on who you are and how you work best. You, Y-O-U, are the key to this new way of living and working that is taking hold. It is clear that each of us now has the opportunity to be original and live life on our own terms. Tell us how you are an original. Share your story with us at you at success.com because at success, we are nothing without you. Thanks for listening to Success Talks. Join us next month for more great interviews with some of the world's top thought leaders, authors, and entrepreneurs. To learn how to share success with your friends and business associates, visit success.com. While you're there, sign up to receive the free newsletter, Inside Success, to get great ideas, inspiration, and quotes delivered to your inbox every week. Success Magazine Audio, copyright 2016 by Success, all rights reserved.